with great pleasure. Uh, let me welcome you to this UTIC event in conjunction with the Economic Society and the school and I'd now like to hand over to Dr Linda Yu. Thanks very much, Amy. And um, it's nice to be here, and, but I'm pretty convinced that you're all here because there's free drinks afterwards. <laughs> uh, so as I understand it, I'm going to speak for about um, 20 minutes or so. I'm going to give you a presentation about what the world economy looks like in a whirlwind about 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do is try and give you an idea about looks and trends. And if they pop the lights, then you might be able to see the slides. I'm going to do this in two parts, um, which is to first look at how we got here. Now, this is really where I think you start to see the signs of 2008. That's, of course, the global financial crisis, the recession, all of this seeming to uh, appear again or to lurk in the background. And then that's really, though, a story of the West. And then I'm going to take a look at where we're headed. And this is much more a story about emerging economies as the new growth drivers and trying to look at some of the longer term trends. And I know a number of you here do um, investments and, and uh, you know, lots of you study economics. So it's always about sort of trying to understand what some of the short-term volatility issues might be, but then have a longer-term perspective. Where is actually the world economy headed? And pick up some of the issues that could be important in the coming year. So it's not so short-termism. And of course, it's very funny speaking uh, about short-termism because um, at a place like Bloomberg, um, I could tell you minute by minute movements of what the market looks like, but um, unless you actually have a context to interpret that data, it doesn't actually make too much sense if I you know, were to uh, tell you today that uh, Italian, that is actually not my phone for once, <laughs> that 10-year um, you know, Italian bond yields are you know, down to 5.5%, unless you actually know that it came from nearly 7.5%, so that's 200 basis point drop. There's not much of a context for you. You wouldn't actually know what that means. So I think that's the reason why it's good to go a bit deeper and to... <laughs> Usually that would be my phone, <laughs> and because I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> um, and you know, so I think that's that's I think the reason why studying um, you know economics, looking at the quality of the context, the qualitative trends, that's why it's so important. Because really anybody could produce a spreadsheet with Bloomberg or Reuters data and show you you know 50 data points. But what's going to make you stand out and be different is that you'll be able to interpret. Um, what that information means. And that matters regardless if you want to ha have an investment career or if you want to have a, uh, an, an, any other career. It's always sort of the person who's able to draw together um, and, the, and provide an analysis of what the information is that matters. So for instance, if someone said to you, well, you know, China could grow at 7% this year, unless you actually know what it used to grow at, which is nearly 10%, and what it's um, fell to during the last downturn, which is about 6%, that 7% wouldn't make much of a difference to you. Or somebody says, oh look, US growth 1.8% this year. Again, what does that mean? Well, it only means something to you if you remember that trend growth is closer to 3%. So that's, that's my way of saying uh, stick to the books. <laughs> and uh, all the other data stuff is easy to come by these days. Okay, let me start off with a stalled recovery because I think this has really been the story of the last, um, really worrying the last year. So if you take a look at this chart, this is industrial production. Economists look for good, what's called good coincident indicators. So something that tells you where the economy is now, because GDP is always backward looking. You get the GDP figures at least three weeks afterwards. Well, China somehow manages to produce GDP figures in two weeks after the end of a quarter, but um, usually it takes about three weeks. So what you're always looking for is a good coincident indicator. A good coincident indicator would be something like industrial production. That actually tells you what producers are doing right now. PMI surveys, ISM surveys, they're essentially industrial production um, type of indicators. They are supply managers. So looking at this indicator, it looks as if the recovery had actually stalled sometime last spring, but it only stalled and became uh, uh, downward trending for high income countries. For developing countries and countries um, like China, they've actually surpassed their 2008 peak and actually they're continuing to grow from there. But if you load notice for high income countries, not only has industrial production taken a turn downwards, they never recovered the peak from 2008. And this is where you start to get the worries about damage growth potential. Maybe that output will never be recovered, in which case unemployment will never go down back to the previous levels. And that's what often happens after a financial crisis, destroyed productive capacity. Okay, 
Looking ahead, this is another picture to kind of show you what the future could look like according to the latest projections, um, also from the World Bank. And what you see is actually really flat industrial production uh, projections. And this is the case for both developing and developed countries. So what this is really suggesting is that one, developed countries may never regain their output potential, but it's going to be a really long slog. And this data matches the GDP figures that we've just had out over the past few days, which essentially tell us that the uh, European Re Union, or specifically the Euro region, is heading for a recession this year. And in fact, all the economies, Germany, the even big ones like Germany, had a contraction in GDP, the first one since 2009. Of course, a really surprising figure was that somehow France managed to outperform Germany, and France is the only major European economy which hasn't had a, a contraction in the last quarter. Now, some of my more cynical colleagues think um, somehow this has to do with Sarkozy and an election and um, uh, things like that, but um, I, I, I have a much more benign explanation, which is that the French economy contracted in the second quarter, so the fact it didn't contract in the fourth quarter, which is the latest set of figures we have, is not that big of a deal. It will contract this year. <laughs> Never trust an economist who says <coughs> things like that, by the way. <laughs> We're terrible at forecasting. Um, let me walk you through the consequences of what happened three years ago and the downturn again this time. The, one of the consequences is clearly high unemployment. That line on top is Spain. Um, and this is actually not the highest it's ever been for Spain. Spain tends to have double-digit unemployment after downturns. But if you look at the unemployment rate across the Euro region in the UK, it actually hasn't peaked. So right now, unemployment rates are at Euro era record highs. So that means that three years after <laughs> the recovery started, not only has unemployment not come down, it's actually still rising. And now we're heading for another leg of downturn. So one of the consequences of that is that you end up with more levels of public spending to have to pay for things like unemployment benefits because there's a high degree of what's called automatic stabilizers. So these are things like welfare payments, transfer payments. They go up when you have high unemployment and a recession, and that adds to the deficit. And then when you include the rescue of banks and what have you, it's not surprising that debt levels have risen across the developed world. And what I'm going to show you later on is that this is a very worrying trend. And of course, how can I skip the euro crisis? I've already said to some of you earlier that in many ways the euro crisis is exceptionally boring <laughs> because everything that's been said about it has virtually been said about has virtually been said 50 times because uh, Greece was first rescued in May of 2010. We're now getting on two years and uh, they've just gotten their second rescue uh, package, but the funds won't be released until Greece uh, produces 38 points of compliance by Wednesday. <laughs> um, that comes from a 95-page document that has to be signed off by the Eurozone leaders over lunch in Brussels on Friday, March the 2nd, after the EU summit on March the 1st and the 2nd. You see the level of minutia that drives, you know, the Euro, it's just, it's incredible. So, I mean, Greece is now heading for its second rescue and possibly its third. But I want to talk a little bit more generally about what's going on in terms of the Euro crisis. I mean, these are the kinds of things that they're trying to do to uh, stabilize the situation. So one is, of course, they need to have some type of way of stabilizing Greece. That remains the big unknown. Uh, bank recapitalization, this is absolutely crucial. And then a firewall. I mean, this is the idea that you need to have some fund big enough to rescue countries should they get into trouble. Um, they also have ECB support. Um, they used to have a fiscal compact. Um, but despite everything that they're doing, bond yields are actually still extremely high. A Greek 10-year debt, the yield on that is 33%. If you try and work out the price, that actually brings the price down to less than 30 uh, cents on the euro. So yields are inversely related to price. Now, 33% is so crazy. I, I couldn't actually work out the price if I didn't actually have someone you know, tell me what it is on a data terminal. Um, but it's actually the case that one of the big keys, I think, to solving the euro crisis is bond markets. Bond markets in the future are not going to change charge the same for the likes of Greece and Portugal to borrow as Germany. So you will get the fiscal discipline, everything they're trying to get through the fiscal compact through the market. Um, so yes, peripheral yields are high, it's a source of worry, but actually, would you rather believe a government would respond to high yields, or would you believe that a government would somehow 
stick to a very strict new set of fiscal compact rules or the structural budget deficit can't be more than half a percent of GDP and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it just seems very unlikely that they would be able to, to do that. So I think this is actually one of the interesting keys going forward. Um, and then let me give you a bit of theory about um, how you should think about um, the euro staying together or breaking up. Like I said, lots of it said about the euro, but actually uh, the euro as a single currency is based on a very simple framework. It's called the optimal currency area. And there's only two criteria within an OCA, which is you should only join a monetary union if you fit, fit these two criteria. That makes up for giving up your own currency and giving up control of interest rates. One is trade integration, so that's the idea that if you have lots of trade with a country, then it might make sense to share currency with that country. That's where you get um, things like uh, what the first criteria. And that actually, for most EU countries, they meet this. I mean, the amount of trade integration is huge. Some three quarters of trade in the EU is intra-EU. But the second criteria is harder, which is convergence in incomes and business cycles. So in other words, if you can't really be as productive as Germany, then would it make sense to stay and share the same currency? If you, so therefore, that leaves you with two options. One is you can either have fiscal transfers to artificially produce the convergence in incomes, and that's what a lot of the people in the Euro crisis talk about, fiscal transfers. Can you have fiscal transfers from the north to the south? But just think about that as being rather unsustainable over the longer term anyways. Um, or you do it the real way, which is to actually bring down unit labor costs, increase productivity, and truly converge. So if you can't do that, then the question is, why stay in a monetary union where you wouldn't be able to suit the criteria and you're always going to be, um, it's always going to be problematic. And I think the best example of this now is Greece, which I sort of skimmed over because I'm, because so much has been said about Greece. But I think for the Greeks, the question is, why would you stay in a currency area and have another eight years of austerity so that your debt to GDP ratio by 2020 is 120.5% of GDP. I mean, that's twice what would be considered to be a sustainable level. And that's if everything goes smoothly for the next eight years. Um, so the question there is, why stay in? If they go out, they could devalue, and they could not um, have to endure the kind of austerity and supervision being imposed on them. So that's really the question that countries have to ask themselves. The problem is, once you ask that of Greece, you're going to ask that of Portugal as well. And then when you ask that of Portugal, Ireland is next. And then you've got Spain. Once you hit Italy, you're up to the third biggest country in the Eurozone. You may as well just ask, why would Germany stay? And because uh, once France has already been downgraded, it's lost its AAA rating. Once you lose Italy and then you lose France, there's only Germany left and its supply chain partners, like the Netherlands and Austria, in which case, hmm, why, why bother? Okay, <laughs> um, so there's a lot of uncertainty in the short term in the West. Financial uh, crisis aftermath, damage growth potential, but I want to move to the more uh, exciting story over the medium term or the longer term, which is the shift from West to East. There was no recession last time in the big emerging markets. This was practically unheard of. I remember at the time, lots of um, people were very skeptical of the idea that countries which are so export dependent like China could possibly grow if the West went into recession. And it did, it did manage it. But not just China, but also India, Indonesia. So in other words, big countries with domestic demand. And one of the key issues is that they had no financial contagion. They just didn't trade in the toxic assets from before. And this time, the same countries don't actually trade in sovereign debt. So they don't actually hold the CDSs or the uh, sovereign debt holdings that is crippling European banks. But the big caveat here is those are the big emerging economies. The smaller countries often have the worst downturns because they are so dependent on the markets of big Western countries. So they tend to have bigger drops in output. And emerging Europe is the best example of this. This is the real shift. I hinted at this earlier. This is the very first time outside of wartime where the median debt level of the emerging economies is lower than that of the developed countries. So if you take the G20, you split it up into developed countries and emerging economies, the debt to GDP ratio of emerging economies is 40%. The debt to GDP ratio of developed economies is 
double that. It's 80%. And as I said, it's the first time outside of war that this is the case. And if you think about high debt levels, increasing interest payments, and becoming eventually a drag on growth, 80% is not brilliant. Once you hit 90%, you really are looking at significant drags on growth. So this is the real shift. Debt used to be a problem that we would teach when we were talking about developing countries. But now this is the issue that the so-called rich countries have to contend with. So this is the proposition. Emerging economies, better positioned in terms of debt, manage the last downturn reasonably well, that they are in position to drive the world economy because they're fast growing, and that certainly does help. But what I'm going to put to you is that they're also more volatile. So this would be a picture of the old world. This is the world growth rate tracked against the EU and the United States. This is a world driven by emerging economies. They're much more volatile. So if this is the growth driver going forward, then we are going to have to get used to movements in GDP, not of a quarter percent, but from double digits down to single digits or negative territory in a very short period of time. So why? What, is the, what are the sources of volatility? I'm just going to run through these quickly. One is they lack fine-tuning tools. One is monetary policy. The second one is fiscal policy. Developing countries have fixed exchange rates. Many of them do. That means that they don't have an independent monetary policy. Often, they don't have a welfare state. The share of government to GDP is small, except in Africa. It's large, but it's inefficient. So they don't have fiscal policy that operates in an automatic way, like in automatic stabilizers, they're discretionary. So for those two reasons, you tend to get an inability to fine tune business cycles. Secondly, political instability. Guess which was the country that investors had picked as the most promising emerging market in the MENA region, that's the Middle East North Africa region, um, two years ago? Of course, Egypt, stable political system, Western allies, well positioned in the region, big market. Yeah, exactly. I think that says it all. <laughs> and uh, banking financial crises. Um, this now, I think, is a risk for every country, but um, there have been a number of banking financial crises in developing countries. So this was one of the reasons for their volatility. But I'm just now going to say this is a problem everywhere. Uneven catch up growth. This is actually the big one, which is the reason why you get a volatile growth rate is because these countries are in a catch up process. They're actually far from the technology frontier. The ability to catch up, to mimic the technology and capability out there is, one, is the reason why uh, developing countries should grow faster than developed countries. But the experience in the post war period is the opposite. Developing countries don't actually grow faster. And this is the uneven partness of the process. So if you look at the last 15, 20 years, you would say, well, of course they grow faster. But if you actually track the data back to 1950, you'll find it's actually the case that they don't grow faster. And it's always been a puzzle to economists as to why it is poor countries don't grow faster because of this catch-up potential. But that's also why it's very uneven, because you can have periods of strong catch-up like in Africa, which was the fastest growing region in the world in the 1950s and even into the 60s. And then, of course, it started to fall apart towards the end of the 60s and the 70s, and then revived again in the 2000s. But even if they grow fast, low levels of income. That is implications for investors. So if you take a look at this chart, fast growth rates, but even in China, the biggest engine of growth in the coming years, average incomes are a tenth of what they are in the West. So selling to that market is a completely different proposition. But I would say the future is with the X, and that is not a typo. It's not the BRICS, <laughs> because I don't think Brazil and Russia are the growth drivers. Consensus forecasts show their shared global GDP to be the same um, in three years' time as it, as it was a few years ago. Um, but the X acronym, I know, is not going to be very attractive. But, uh, but anyways, it's the billion-plus populations of China and India. I mean, these are, you look at the breakdown of what drives global growth, and then you look at forecasts going forward. Pretty much and the major organizations like the IMF have China as the biggest engine. And then it's followed by either the US or India. And this gives you a picture in terms of share of GDP that as a share of global GDP, the BRICS 
will be as big as the G7, but if you look at the increase, what's driving the increase, it's China and India. Why? Well, if you take a longer term look at what drives global GDP, it's actually very simple. Um, GDP is just what an economy produces in a given year. So it depends on your population. So there's no reason why countries which account for, in Asia, half the world's population shouldn't account for half of global GDP. Um, and if you look from the 19th century, the early part of the 19th century, um, that was indeed the case. And this is based on work from Angus Madison. So now this could imply that the West is in for a period of uh, relative decline, but we can get into that later. That's, that's immediately what people from small countries in the West start to think. This is me, wait a minute, that looks good, except wait, I'm from, you know, Luxembourg or something. <laughs> what about my income? Okay, so to wrap up, global economic outlook. My take on this is that it's very positive to have more growth drivers in the world. It's much more balanced. Um, it's better than having one major economy be the engine of growth like the United States has been. Um, this doesn't go down so well when I speak in the United States. <laughs> but it really is good to have multiple <laughs> growth drivers. Um, but they're poor countries that are driving the growth, so they're fast growing and they're more volatile. And they still need global integration because that's the key to catch-up growth. And any backlash or protectionism could really hurt that. Um, but many opportunities, including in the West, the US, I think, is incredible for its technolo uh, technological innovativeness, its competitiveness, its entrepreneurialness. It is, that's not a real word, its entrepreneurial spirit. And Europe, I'm actually very, I mean, I actually think Europe in terms of getting its act together, the single market, it has the diversity to be truly a heterogeneous and therefore um, potentially very a productive single market. So this I mean, there's half a billion people in the EU 27. The single market has encompasses countries which have low levels of income, others which have high levels of income. So that means that you could actually have extremely efficient production supply, distribution chains, markets, all the components are there. It is just that uh, we need to get through the short-term hump of, well, you know, the Euro crisis, and uh, we already went through that. <laughs> um, and finally, I actually think for the West, it's very good to have competition. And here's another source of competition. I was recently in Southeast Asia. They want to form a single market. They're moving towards 2015, a single Asian market. They're going to take the half a billion people in Southeast Asia the ASEAN countries, the 10 countries, and they actually want to form a single market like the EU. And they want to do this because they think you need the size to compete with the likes of China, India, which have a billion plus people, United States, 300 million people. If you don't have scale, then your companies can't achieve economies of scale and efficiency domestically. So in Southeast Asia, they have a lot of the same traits as you do in the EU heterogeneity in terms of populations, in terms of productivity, in terms of levels of development. And they think their future is to create the kind of market, the kind of block that could be competitive. And should they succeed in that, which I really hope they do, then that really does set up a world where you have big blocks, a big internal market that could increase competitiveness um, everywhere. And they could be very positive growth drivers um, looking forward. So. I mean, I suppose my end takeaway is it's always good to have competition. Just, lo just look at how much better seats on British Airways are now after Virgin's <laughs> come in. <laughs> to me, that says everything. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you very much.